Hopefully that worked. Yes. Uh, let's see, should I get started? Sure, go ahead. Okay, great, great. Uh, so uh, my name is Jeff Schneider. I co-direct the Auton Lab along with uh, Barnabas Poxos and Arthur Dabrowski. Um, you can see my title slide here, Machine Learning for Controlling Complex Autonomous Systems. That's what I'm interested in. Um, we only have 10 minutes here. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to direct you to a talk that I gave for the Robotics Institute seminar uh, in February of 2019. So if you Google my name and uh, and RI seminar, you'll find it, or you can Google my, my name and self-driving cars and you'll find it. Um, that gives you a lot of the motivation for my experience, um, just for some history. I was one of the folks that took a leave in 2015 to help Uber start its self-driving car program. I was there for three and a half years and then uh, returned to CMU full-time in the fall of 2018. So my experiences there are a lot of my motivation for what I think are important research topics now. Uh, but in 10 minutes, I don't have time to go into all of that. Uh, but in my RI seminar, I talked about all of it for an hour. So uh, what I'm gonna do now is just uh, blast ahead uh, to what's relevant for this particular meeting, whoops, which is uh, what our opportunities are on, on current projects here. Um, and so I'm going to jump right into those. Um, so the first one is, um, uh, many of you may know that Argo opened uh, an AI center here on campus. And so I'm working with them. Uh, and so we have a project with Argo on doing reinforcement learning for self-driving cars. And so, uh, again, you can see the details of why I think this is the right thing to do. Uh, from, from my other talk. Uh, but the bottom line is the uh, self-driving cars that are on the roads right now, uh, they do well, but they are extremely engineer intensive. Uh, and what needs to happen with them now is we need to squash down the long tail of rare events and we need to scale it up across, uh, across many domains, across cities uh, around the world. And I don't believe that will be commercially viable uh, using the, the current methods that self-driving car companies are, are using. And so that's why uh, we started this project on reinforcement learning for self-driving cars. Now, uh, I wanna talk just a little bit about the, uh, the, the research questions um, and sort of the, the pros and cons for using RL and self-driving cars. Of course, as we all know, it's, uh, it's become very trendy due to some, uh, some recent successes. Um, it's turned out to be particularly good for games, uh, for simulations, for low dimensional state spaces. Um, all those things, the reason it succeeds is because e either getting lots of trials online is cheap, so you can do it, or in the case of really low dimensional problems, you can figure it out without too many trials. Uh, unfortunately, self-driving cars don't have either of those properties. Um, and furthermore, no one's gonna let you put a reinforcement learning algorithm along with uh, uh, say an Epsilon greedy exploration strategy on a real car on the road. Uh, that's just not gonna happen. So we need some, uh, some other things. Uh, so, uh, the things we want to focus on now is getting better sample complexity. And of course, everybody talks about sample complexity and reinforcement learning. But once you look at a real problem on a real physical system, uh, this makes sample complexity a real thing. Uh, we need this because we will never get a lot of samples from the long tail of rare events that happen on the road that we need to solve before a car can actually uh, drive without a driver on the, on the road. There are some other things that make the problem not quite so hard. One is that, uh, for those of you that are familiar with the challenges in, in various games, uh, for example, Montezuma's Revenge was one of the harder ones for a long time. 
And the reason was because there was sort of a long magic action sequence that you had to discover uh, in order to get the big rewards. And so you were just searching around looking for this sequence. Well, that's not really the case with self-driving cars. With self-driving cars, you get dense rewards every time step. You get rewards based on how close you are to the trajectory you're supposed to be on um, and how close you are to objects you're not supposed to be close to. And the other thing is the time horizons aren't that long. So in a, in a self-driving car, nothing that happens beyond 10 or 20 seconds is relevant for anything other than the top level uh, route planning. Finally, we do have to worry about off-policy learning um, um, and offline learning, again, because nobody's going to let us put a reinforcement learner on a real car. But the good news is we have logs. The self-driving car companies, including Argo, have millions of miles of logs, uh, and actually logs that were run with pretty good policies already. Um, so this is a real opportunity for us to utilize off-policy learning. And what's especially interesting is that you can do something called log replay. Again, if you go back to my RI seminar from last year, it'll, it'll show you what log replay looks like. What that means is you can replay a log that was collected at least for a short period of time, maybe five or 10 seconds, and change what the actor did uh, and see how that affects the, the, the performance of, of the reward in the scene. So that's kind of a unique opportunity with self-driving cars. Finally, although we'd like to do this completely end-to-end -end ultimately, uh, anybody who's worked in RL and Vision knows that uh, plugging in raw sensor data to an RL system is a challenge. Uh, so we're gonna start with just the motion planning problem and assume that the perception system is there already. Um, I'm gonna give you an idea what this looks like so far. Uh, this is, you can look up uh, Tanmay and Hitesh's. They, they just did their uh, master's dissertation. They were the first ones on this project. And what you're seeing here is the Carla self-driving car simulator. Uh, and this controller is now the best reinforcement learned controller uh, on the benchmark problems for this. This particular one is using PPO. Uh, and you'll see it uses an overhead rasterization of a semantically segmented image. Uh, it's got a couple of the basics down. It can navigate the roads. Uh, it knows how to handle traffic lights. And of course, it knows how to queue be, be behind cars in front of it. Um, but there's a lot more to do. Obviously, this is a, this is a very simplified version of the self-driving car problem. Okay, uh, I'm gonna just jump ahead to the second project. There's three all together, and I wanna make sure I have time to spend on each one. We have another project funded by the Army, which is a a multi-robot autonomous reconnaissance system. And so what it is is multiple ground, ground robots, multiple aerial robots, um, and they will do a reconnaissance job where they're given a zone, and what they need to do is just go out there and uh, detect all the objects of interest out there and, and populate them back. Um, the big opportunity this year, so we put, uh, we're one year into this and we put the basics in place. I'll actually show you the video in a second. Um, but now we're getting into what are the real learning based decisions to make in terms of where the robots should drive, where they should look, how they should fuse their information and all the decision making that the robots have to do beyond just doing the basic autonomy problem. And so we did this demo uh, this was uh, a month ago. That's me in the background. That's one of the Army folks uh, speaking there on the right. This is the area we did it in. Uh, you saw some of the robots there. Um, I'm gonna, here's what one of the robots looks like. This is a John Deere, kind of like a garden utility tractor. Uh, and so uh, what you're seeing here is the vehicle in front is the autonomous vehicle. It's driving around there. The one behind it is just, a, a, is just a chase vehicle for people that wanna watch how that robot's doing. Uh, as it drives around, you'll see there's some things for it to find. Um, and so there's some mannequins around there. There's some pickup trucks. Uh, there are some other of these kind of uh, ATV vehicles. You can see there it stopped. There's a mannequin to the left of it there that it's looking at. Um, same thing with the... Uh, uh, the drones, so it's hard to tell the scale of this thing, but this is a wingspan of about six feet. Uh, it has a payload of about 15 pounds, so it can carry 
uh, a nice set of sensors, and it's flying around the same area, again, looking for the same things. You can see there's some vehicles down there, uh, different things for it to find. Now, all of this is controlled through uh, a single user interface. So the demo we did actually controlled two ground, gr ground robots. You can see the guy in the lower right, see that little tablet? He's actually controlling the entire system right from that little, little tablet. So it's two of these ground vehicles, um, two aerial vehicles, and one other ground vehicle that's actually running around thanks to the COVID restrictions. That fifth vehicle is actually running around the University of Texas at Austin's campus uh, down in Texas. And so we integrated them all together. What you can see here is that the, the yellow things are objects that are detected. And when you click on them, you see a thumbnail of what it is. So you can see this particular one uh, that the system found a uh, found one of the mannequins out there. Um, and so the big opportunity now is how do you use learning, Bayesian optimization, reinforcement learning to improve the performance of the system and to help the robots. Uh, what you saw there existing uh, was, was the, the waypoints were provided by that operator. But now we need the robots to decide for themselves where to look. Thankfully, we have this simulation you see here. Uh, we can use the simulation for the learning algorithms. Uh, so that's the second project. Third project. Uh, the third project uh, deals with controlled nuclear fusion. And so uh, at first glance, uh, you might say, well, those first two feel a lot like self-driving cars and autonomy. This third one's a bit different. Um, it is, but the, but the algorithmic problems we want to solve are the same ones. Um, so nuclear fusion, if you're not uh, familiar with it, um, this is not nuclear fission. This is not uranium. This is not the reactors that we have generating power now. This is something that if we can figure it out, will be far better. So this is fusion. This uses uh, what's in the center of the sun. And what that means is it's a nearly infinite source of energy because it just uses the hydrogen you get from water. Um, it's also nice because it doesn't have the uh, radioactive um, uh, byproducts of it. When you do fusion, what comes out of it is helium. And so there's no, um, uh, there's no byproducts to worry about. And the other thing, of course, is uh, these systems don't blow up. Like a, like a fission reactor could if things went bad. These just kind of, the plasma just leaks away if you fail to do this. So the way it works is you put the plasma in a shape of a torus like you see here. You wrap the torus in magnets and you use a magnetic field to compress and heat the plasma to the point where you get fusion. Um, and so that all sounds simple, except that the dynamics governing, governing this you can think of this as taking Maxwell's equations for electromagnetism and crossing them with Navier-Stokes for fluid dynamics. They're completely nonlinear, and although we could argue that those sets of equations describe it fully, we don't really have a computational tract computationally tractable version of those equations that really give us a good model. So most of the models we do use are very approximate. Now, the good news is we have simulations of this, so we can do learning on them. We also have data from the real device you see in the picture. And so we can learn, we can do model-based RL by learning models from the data from the device and then learning policies on those models. And so the research opportunity there is um, how we develop the reinforcement learning algorithms to do this kind of offline model-based learning how we can combine, combine active optimization with that and ultimately get controllers that can operate tokamak stably at very high, press, uh, very high pressures. We just got new funding from the D Department of Energy to pursue this. Um, and the idea is if we can get something that works in simulation, um, we'll have an opportunity to try the controller on the real, uh, the real tokamak. Um, so with that, uh, I think I'll, I'll just stop and, and take questions. Um, we are uh, looking at uh, taking students on any, uh, any of these three projects.